Hello, this is Ken Roberts, and welcome to the Best of the Insight Line. The Insight Line is a weekly recorded message that we provide for our Rich Man Secret course members. Each message examines sound, practical techniques for spiritual enrichment. Now, you're probably asking, why does Ken offer a course like that? What does spirituality have to do with commodities? The answer is, it has everything to do with making wise decisions in commodities and every other area of your life. If the word spirituality bothers you, substitute the word psychology instead. In a recent interview, the illustrious financial wizard John Templeton, and now Sir John Templeton, said, A person is more likely to be successful managing money if he uses spiritual principles. And he added, all careers are more successful and satisfying if you use spiritual principles. I can't think of a single exception, he said. When you live from your spiritual nature, your decisions are wiser for two reasons. First, it puts everything into proper perspective so you are not intimidated by the financial world. Second, you learn to recognize and ignore self-defeating attitudes and fear thoughts that would otherwise prevent you from seeing clearly and acting confidently. If you want to pursue these life-healing ideas, the Ken Roberts Company can help. A Rich Man Secret Course introduces you to renowned spiritual teachers like Vernon Howard and Guy Finley and provides a practical approach to the spiritual life. My special bookstore, Four Star Books, carries a large selection of books, tapes, and videotapes that can help you further along on your spiritual journey. I urge you to use both of these great resources and follow up on these ideas. And now, here's a collection of the very best Insight Line messages from the last several years. I know you'll enjoy them. There's a now famous story about a painting that was accidentally hung upside down in a museum. For many months, this mistake went unnoticed by the museum's visitors as well as its supposedly expert staff. Then one day, a visitor, one single observer, recognized the mistake, told a museum staff member, and the picture finally was placed upright. What we study here on the Insight Line reminds me of that story. All the museum's staff and visitors, meaning the rest of the world, hurriedly rush through life and never take the time to stop and really see what's right there in front of them. What's going on was described in the movie Joe vs. the Volcano with this one powerful line. Almost the whole world is asleep. Everybody you know, everybody you see everybody you talk to. Only a few people are awake, and they live in a state of constant, total amazement. Do you live in a state of constant, total amazement? No, you and I don't. But to begin living a truly happy and successful life, we must take this first step to see that something's wrong, that the picture's upside down. And just because only a relative handful of us are aware that something's wrong with the picture, that should encourage you. Now that you know, the alternative is to, as Joe versus the Volcano says, simply go back to sleep, which is what most people in fact do. So where do we begin? Well, a good place to start is to see how difficult it is to remember yourself and to come awake for even a few moments. As best-selling author Guy Finley explains in The Secret of Letting Go, snap yourself out of psychic slumber. He goes on, we can all agree that no intelligent, conscious man or woman would ever intentionally hurt him or herself. It is important that we are in agreement about this precept. No one would choose to ache Yet the fact remains that all of us do hurt ourselves every day with bursts of anger or fits of depression or anxiety. There can be no doubt, beginning with the physical level and on up, that fear and worry exact a definite toll on all levels of our health and well-being. 
intelligent, conscious beings would never intentionally hurt themselves, but we somehow manage to do just that in one way or another almost every day. So how do we reconcile this contradiction? There's only one possible conclusion that we can draw from these facts, and it is imperative that we paint this picture clearly to ourselves. Obviously, we are unconscious while thinking that we are awake, he continues. In other words, during those times of self-betrayal, when we are hurting ourselves or others with negative inner states, even though our eyes are open and all kinds of sensations are coursing through us, we must be asleep to what we are doing to ourselves or we wouldn't be doing it. Somehow we will discover just exactly how we have become separated from the real intelligence within us that knows better than to punish itself. There is never, I repeat, never, he says, any intelligent reason to feel bad. If you will only let these truthful ideas prove this astonishing fact to you, one day this new understanding will go before you and defeat all that has been defeating you. So what do I do now, you're wondering? Well, you're doing it. Instead of simply feeling depressed, angry, and anxious, now see yourself in those painful states. That's it. That's the very beginning to end what now defeats you. Until next week, this is Ken Roberts on the Insight Live. Welcome. This is Chris Roberts on the Insight Line. This week's edition is a bit different because with me today is best-selling author Guy Finley, who wrote the popular Secret of Letting Go, The Secret Way of Wonder, his new book, Freedom from the Ties That Bind, and a book you're all familiar with as Rich Man Secret Course members, The Powerful Key of Kings book. Welcome, Guy. Hello, Chris. Guy, what I'm looking for is to have command over myself in every situation. Is this possible? Yes, Chris. Not only is it possible for us to have command over our lives at all times, but we are actually meant to have this kind of command. But before we can win true self-command, we must first come to understand what our true self is. When a person believes that his life hinges on what others think about him, when a, a woman believes that her only value is in her cooking or in her office expertise, then what happens is little by little, our sense of self gets all interwoven with what other people are saying about us what we're thinking about ourselves relative to the very identity that we've named for ourselves. It's impossible to be in command over this kind of self because this self changes every time the world changes. Someone looks at you backwards and your sense of self changes because that self that you've been living from is somehow wrapped up in what that person thinks about you. So we can't command this is very good if we'll all listen. We can't command what we don't possess. And what we don't possess is our self when our sense of self is nothing other than the dominant thought or feeling at the moment. So the first work that we have to do before we can command ourselves is begin to understand what our self really is. Is our self our thoughts? No. Is our self our feelings? No. Our thoughts and feelings a part of ourself? Yes. But when we mistake the part for the whole, that's the same as agreeing to suffer. Because every time some thought changes, every time some feeling changes, or someone says something disparaging that causes those thoughts or feelings to change, that's the same as losing our sense of self. In my book, The Secret Way of Wonder, I tell a little story about a man who leans over a babbling brook in order to see himself. But because the brook is streaming past him very quickly and quickly changing itself, his reflection quickly changes over and over again, and he fears that he's losing himself. This is a very, very simple but accurate metaphor for the way we're presently living. 
we are trying to find ourselves in a changing world instead of living from that changeless aspect of ourself that recognizes this world changes, but I needn't go along with it. This new understanding about my true nature is where true self-command begins and ends. Self-command comes with understanding that this flood of thoughts and feelings that rush through me when I'm faced with something not to my liking, that those thoughts and feelings are not me. You are not at any time any thought or feeling that wants to wash you away with it. Self-command, the root of it, is in understanding that who I really am isn't in thought or feeling at all. And as I am able to step back and watch my own thoughts and feelings as they arise, I am also, to that extent, empowered with real command. Then I can choose what I want to do because I am no longer a part of this flood that has always been my life. As we bring this session to a close today, I'd like to thank you, Guy, again for helping us see clearly into these ideas and recommend to you the wonderful book, The Secret Way of Wonder. It will help you explore these ideas further, and you can contact Dolores at Four Star Books. That's 1-800-350-2350. Five zero, And I'd like to remind you of your exercise this week, which is to take a new kind of conscious command of yourself by learning to step back and impartially observe your thoughts and feelings. Thanks for joining us and be sure to listen in next week as the insight line continues. Look at the faces of people around you. Many of them look discouraged, don't they? How would your life be different if you never felt discouraged again? Hello, I'm Dr. Ellen Dickstein. Welcome to the Insight Line. We get discouraged when, in spite of all our efforts, we can't seem to overcome the things that have always held us back. We think, what's the use? I'll just fail again. Experts say the best predictor of future performance is past performance, and common logic agrees. But here, in a rich man's secret course, we are learning that common logic does not have to be true for us. Unaware people may continue unconsciously along the path created by habit, but we are learning to see through the hoax of self-defeating thoughts that tell us nothing will ever change. Our lives can be transformed. The purpose of our existence is to change our nature and rise above a mechanical, repetitious life into a world of freedom, creativity, and constant newness. It's possible to do this because now is always new. The past does not really exist except in our memories. Things we've done in the past may have established conditions that exist now and that we must deal with now. But if we change our attitudes and behavior now, those conditions will change. Our lives can be healed if we will recall that who I am now and not who I was in the past is all that matters now. I remembered this the other day and escaped considerable distress. For some reason, I started thinking about a painful experience from years ago. The experience wasn't even that bad, just the kind of thing we all go through when young. But I got caught up in the memory and waves of despair washed over me. Suddenly, I came to myself and saw what was happening. I realized with relief that none of that existed anymore. Nothing was forcing me to torture myself by reliving that event in my mind. I was a victim of unconscious self-torment. Just seeing it freed me to rouse myself awake and go on. This simple secret of separating ourselves from our thoughts is how we begin to change our nature and literally transform. Vernon Howard frequently urged us to shake ourselves awake and start life over. The present moment is alive with limitless possibilities. Be alert so you don't miss a single one. You can start fresh any time you remember that you can. But now maybe you're thinking, that may work for other people, but not for me. I've been through too much. 
I'm too burdened down by my past. Vernon once gave us a marvelous encouragement. He said, if a man had done wrong for 90 years and then suddenly came to himself and determined to change, at that moment the entire previous 90 years would be canceled out and he would be a new man. That's it. There is no time but now. Change now and everything is new. We all have a choice in life. We can continue on, lost in thought, never changing, and each day will just be a repetition of the past. There may be some comfort in familiarity, but it isn't life with a capital L, is it? Most people make this choice. No wonder they're discouraged. They really have nothing to look forward to except the rearview mirror of their past. The other choice requires some daring. It means letting go of familiar thoughts and looking at things in a new way. It can be scary because reality may not agree with our long-held beliefs. We may not know exactly who we are anymore, but then we need no longer be limited by who we thought we were, and the possibilities for new happiness are endless. Henry David Thoreau said, only that day dawns to which we are awake. The day never really dawns for someone lost in an unconscious state. Everything is just a repetition of the past. When we are new, each day is new, and discouragement is gone forever. Until next time, this is Dr. Ellen Dickstein on the Insight Line. Thanks for joining me. Watch instead of talk and see how much more quality you allow to enter your life. Human beings generally just talk too much, and it causes us to miss out on much of life's riches. This week on the Insight Line, we'll look at the wisdom and benefit of talking less. Welcome, this is Ken Roberts. Recently, I've seen that I talk too much. One night I awoke and winced as I recalled how much I had been talking earlier that evening. So in all situations now, as often as I can remember, I only speak when necessary. And you know, very few words are really necessary to conduct the business of living. So now, with all this free time on my hands, I'm observing so much more than ever before. Now I notice and really notice what others say and do, and I'm learning that just about everyone operates on nervous energy, spouting like tea kettles under pressure. The whole world does this. Listen to radio, watch TV, listen to people talking to each other. You'll see what I've been seeing. Most of the talk is nervous and pressurized, and most of it is completely unnecessary. I cannot say what an impact these new observations have had on me. All I can do is recommend that you try it too and experience the rich understanding you will gain by doing so. Several of you have written me lately to ask about procrastination, and I have more insight into this common enemy since I've been talking less. What I've seen is that the less I talk, the more I accomplish. Talking hinders my creativity and keeps me from completing the work I need to do. This includes mental chattering, too. If I sit in my chair and listen to the litany of things to do that my mind grinds out, I may as well be blabbing with a group of people about nothing worthwhile. If I just stop and realize that I can only do one thing at a time, choose one item from that list I must tackle, and then get going on that one item, all is well and I'm in control of my life instead of those tormenting thoughts that want to control me. Vernon Howard taught an exercise on this subject of being deliberate and not waffling as we do so much. He called it the do one thing at a time exercise. For example, if you get up from your desk to fetch a book, just do that one task. Get up from your chair, go collect the book, 
and come back to your desk. What you'll see is that your mind will tell you to stop and do this, that, and the other thing on your way to or from getting the book. But stay determined and only get the book and come right back. Then, if one of those other tasks your mind came up with that it told you was so important to do is really necessary, go do that task, but do one task only. As you perform this exercise, don't fall into your mind's trap when it tells you that it would be wiser to conserve steps and energy by doing two or three tasks at once. Don't save an extra trip across the office as it will tell you to do. Remember our aim here, to take control of your life, to take back the authority we've been giving away. When you finish reading or listening to this in just a moment, you're going to go do something. Put this do one thing at a time exercise to work for you right now, and then repeat it as often as you can remember. You'll be in charge of your life and put an end to the confusion, procrastination, and blabbing that's been stealing your time and energy. Until next time, thanks for joining me. This is Ken Roberts on the Insight Line. In the current monthly Insight Line Bulletin, we explored ways to defeat what's been defeating us. And this week on the Insight Line, let's discuss another way we defeat ourselves and how we can rise above it. I've entitled this edition, Why We Should Not Help Other People. Welcome. This is Chris Roberts with this week's edition of the Insight Line. Are you shocked at the idea of not helping other people? That's good, because none of us realizes the harm we create for ourselves and others when we meddle in their affairs. When we interfere in another person's life, we prevent him or her from learning valuable life lessons. We actually hold people down and rob them of the experiences they need to learn and grow. I know it's frustrating to stand by and watch someone you know possibly someone you love, make a terrible blunder. But if you look back on your own life, when were the times that you learned the biggest lessons life presented you? Weren't these times when life delivered you major blows and you had no control over what happened? Weren't they when you had to go forward slowly, step by step, not sure of what you were doing, but moving forward anyway, because you knew no other way to go? Perhaps it was when you lost your job of many years, or when the relationship ended, or you lost a loved one. Or how about when you failed at something you considered vitally important? It wasn't what people said to you or tried to do for you that helped. Wasn't it your own inner strength that guided and directed you through these trying times? A caterpillar weaves its cocoon and later must muscle its way out, gaining strength through the innate desire to be free. Its reward for the effort is its transformation into a butterfly. But if you were to help the caterpillar by snipping open its cocoon, you actually rob it of the struggle to break free, and the caterpillar will not survive. Inner Life author Vernon Howard gives a strong medicine for this destructive habit we're all predisposed to. In his remarkable little booklet, Your Power to Say No, he says, Almost all human advice is worthless. This does not refer to technical advice, such as necessary education in science and mechanics and other subjects of daily need. It refers to psychological advice in which one deluded human being says he knows what is best for another human being. He doesn't know. He is a lost wanderer in the desert, teaching others in a desperate attempt to convince himself that he knows the way out. He hides his despair and ignorance behind a false front of confidence and authority, but he can't deceive himself. His advice is not only useless, but downright dangerous and cruel. 
for he prevents human beings from finding the pure cure of reality. Don't we have enough work to do on ourselves? Let's leave everyone else alone and concentrate our energy on our own inner development. We can begin by studying those parts of ourselves that insist on giving advice, even when it's not asked for. So let this be our exercise this week. For just one week, under no circumstances, give your opinion or advice to anyone. I promise you, this is a very big challenge. And if you're like me, you're going to have to be very tenacious in your efforts. One of the gems you'll discover is that you won't have much to talk about because your identity is all tied up in your advice and opinions. You'll also learn that most people will be relieved that you're leaving them alone. But if they're not, it's because they want you to make their decisions for them so they can blame you if things don't turn out right. I know this seems like tough medicine. Vernon Howard once said, the medicine... Thanks for on the Insight Line. This is Chris Roberts. Today we're going to discover the truth about that person you think. Think about what it would be like to have a friend like this. Just as your alarm clock goes off in the morning, your friend calls and suggests that you deserve to go back to sleep for a few minutes. Ten minutes later, your friend comes over and accuses you of being lazy for not getting up with the alarm. After all, how are you going to get everything accomplished today? While you're getting ready for work, your friend comments on your appearance and points out those few pounds you've put on. Your friend also keeps reminding you of that big meeting you have today and how you're not really prepared because you went to that movie last night. Neglecting to mention, of course, that the movie was your friend's idea. You arrive at the office. As the boss walks by, as soon as the boss is out of sight, your friend accuses you of being a hypocritical wimp. The final blow comes at lunch. You had planned to order the diet plate, but your friend urges you to get the double cheeseburger with curly fries. You can't really enjoy your meal because your friend keeps blabbing about nonsense. Then, just as you finish the last bite, your friend reminds you about the diet and criticizes you for eating so much. What would you do if you had a friend like that? Chances are, you would end the friendship. But when you think about it, haven't I just been describing what your own thoughts do to you all day? Vernon Howard commented many times, that we do things to ourselves that we would never put up with from another person. Unfortunately, most of us put up with this continuous self-haranguing because we are completely unaware that it's going on. We have become so used to the constant nagging of the inner voice that we never question its authority, but we do suffer because of it. Sudden feelings of self-doubt, worry, or fear can all be traced back to our own thoughts. Our major mistake is that we believe those thoughts are the real us. How could they not be my friend, we ask? They're me. This is the great hoax that is exposed by esoteric principles like those we study in a rich man's secret course. Those thoughts are part of the conditioned false self. They were meant to do practical work, while the true self lives and gets direction from a higher place. Somehow, the right order of things has been turned around. Now the thoughts have taken control of everything, and we've forgotten that the higher place exists altogether. Our confused, pained, directionless lives are the result. We don't hurt ourselves intentionally. We do it in a state of psychological and spiritual sleep. The good news is that we can wake up to this inner betrayal and start ignoring the self-tormenting voices. The next time you find yourself confused or unhappy, track back to the thought that ordered you to feel that way. And remember that it is a false friend you need not obey. When you begin to distinguish the right, higher voice from the voice of the false friend, 
you can become a true friend to yourself at last. As author Guy Finley says in The Secret of Letting Go, the false nature has lived unchallenged for a long, long time. Today, right now, is the beginning of the end of it and the true beginning of who you really are. Until next time, this is Dr. Ellen Dickstein on the Insight Line. Thanks for joining me. The famous motion picture High Noon, starring Gary Cooper, depicts an all-powerful psychological technique that you and I can learn to use and invoke to lead the higher life we desire. This week on the Insight Line, we'll discover what this powerful technique is and how to apply it to immediate benefit. Welcome, this is Ken Roberts. In the 1952 classic High Noon, the sheriff of a small western town finds himself losing all control to outlaws. All the citizens are afraid and offer no help whatsoever. The situation spirals downward until it appears that he's the only one who cares if the outlaws take over, but the odds of just one man turning the situation around seem impossible. The climatic scene comes when Gary Cooper is actually leaving town, still haunted by the fact that he's giving up and quitting. But suddenly, he turns his wagon around, goes back to the troubled town, and faces his biggest fear, the enemy. I recommend that you watch High Noon, even if you've seen it before, because it will shed light, a bright new light, on what's going on in our society today. But more importantly, it shows what's going on in our personal lives and what we can do about it. On my seminar tour around the country recently, right outside the doors of some of the most opulent business districts and neighborhoods, I was shocked and saddened to see graffiti. And in New Orleans, Chicago, Boston, and New York, it's even on police cars. Police cars. So what does this say? It says that as a society, we've given up and accepted a lower standard of living for ourselves. It says that the criminal element is gaining ground and that you and I have willingly succumbed to the outlaws. But it feels hopeless, doesn't it? Well, what is society, the world? It's nothing but individuals, you and me. Now, do you have control over anyone but yourself? No, you don't. The topic could fill a book, but the bottom line is you and I have no control over anyone but ourselves. When you realize this fact, you've come a long way, for very few people ever come to learn it. They waste their whole lives trying to control and manipulate others. But when all is said and done, it's like, as Vernon Howard once put it, throwing marshmallows at a mountain. So the only action we can take to make a difference in this world is to work on ourselves individually. And that's what the Rich Man's Secret Course is and always will be about. To focus your energies on anything outside yourself is a waste of time and your life. But how can I possibly do anything about graffiti, crime, smog, pollution, starvation, and wars by focusing on myself? I don't approve of any of these atrocities, you're thinking. Well, yes, you do. It's vital to this. Examine it and see it. The world's downward thinking is also your downward thinking, too. By never examining it, that is, giving in to the dark, heinous operation of the world, you've allowed it to invade and control you. Well, what's happening when someone wrongs you and you shoot mental bullets at him or her? What took you over when you heard that someone lied about you behind your back and hate began churning in your stomach? Why can a knock on the door, a ring of the telephone, or an envelope from the IRS send bolts of fear through us? Why do we always expect news to be bad news? What is it in us that's always on guard ready to retaliate, defend, and fight. 
I'm tired of living at the mercy of whatever this is that puts me through so many mental gyrations day in and day out. I'm exhausted. And if you are too, then we must turn the wagon around as Gary Cooper did, and as scary as it is, go face the outlaws. We must question the authority these bullies have over us and begin to take that authority back. You're standing in the express line at the grocery store when an arrogant woman ahead of you not only has twice the maximum number of items allowed, but also writes a check and whips out a stack of food stamps and coupons. As the pressure of anger builds, your face turns red and your heart begins pounding, simply ask yourself, wait a minute, what just took charge over me here? This is the beginning step. For now, this is all we can do, question what's been taking over our lives. If we do not begin doing this, then we just said, okay, go right ahead to a criminal spray painting graffiti all over a police car. Guy Finley gave a marvelous talk on this very topic of taking back control of our own lives recently to a group of people here in Oregon. I tape recorded this talk and highly recommend that you get a copy of this cassette tape. It's only $7, and it comes with a second related talk that I chose especially for Rich Man's Secret course members. Call Four Star Books and say that you would like to order a copy of Guy Finley's High Noon cassette tape. The ladies at Four Star Books will know exactly what tape you mean. And please note, the tape mentioned here is recommended only for the spiritually strong-hearted. Until next time, this is Ken Roberts on the Insight Line. Please fast forward this tape now to side B. If you've ever been frozen by indecision and procrastination, then this week's talk is for you. Hello, and welcome to the Insight Line. I'm Dr. Ellen Dickstein. A man once stood beside a river. He wanted to cross, but he was afraid. He knew that the river had large boulders and treacherous currents that he could not see. Not knowing which way to go, he just stood there, frozen by indecision. But then he did something marvelous. What did our hero do that changed everything? Realizing he could not see the answer from where he was standing, he climbed a cliff above the river bank. From this higher elevation, he could actually see to the bottom of the river. He could see the boulders and the currents, and he could see areas that were absolutely clear. From his higher view, it was no longer necessary to make a decision about which way to go. The answer was obvious. His true seeing was the right action. It's the same with the big and little decisions we make every day. We have trouble making decisions because we have so many contradictory voices inside us, almost like different people. One just wants to have a good time. Another is afraid to look foolish. A third wants to be liked by everybody. No wonder we're confused. And how can a confused mind that created the dilemma in the first place supply a solution. The confusion ends when we realize that painful decision-making is really due to those many voices inside our heads. Don't waste energy trying to please them all. High above all those false voices is your real self, and your most important task is to put energy into finding that unified self, the true you. Raise your inner life to a higher level and you won't have to fear the boulders and currents of your own confusion. From the higher place, the right way to go is obvious, just as it was for the man in our story. To get to this higher vantage point, practice with everyday decisions. Start by deciding to make finding self-wholeness your first aim in life. Now your other decisions become opportunities for self-learning. You can watch how your mind tries to confuse you. For example, see how your mind inflates the importance of a decision, telling you that all your happiness depends on making the right choice. Then see how concerned you are about how other people will judge your decision. 
Maybe you're ignoring a right voice that tries to warn you against doing something that a wrong part of you finds appealing. Then try to identify other conflicting voices. Finally, make your decision as best you can and watch how the other voices scream even louder to make you feel bad. In his booklet, Your Power to Say No, Vernon Howard teaches us to ignore those voices and get on with your life. And don't be afraid to make a mistake. As Mr. Howard says, we learn to make right decisions by consciously bearing the consequences of our wrong decisions. Happily, conflicting voices grow quiet when ignored. Decisions are put into perspective, and the one true higher voice guides us to a safe passage every time. Now we have attained the choiceless life, where we no longer face painful decisions because what is truly right for us is clear from the beginning, and true seeing is right action. Until next time, this is Dr. Ellen Dickstein on the Insight Line. Thanks for joining me. You never tried this before. Today on the Insight Line, we'll explore a psychological place you've likely never been. It's the place, in fact, that holds all the answers and security and permanence you yearn for, and we'll learn a way to get there. Welcome. This is Ken Roberts. Do you know that the mere fact that you seek something higher, something above the level you now occupy, means that you are capable, all by yourself, of finding the way. There's an intelligence within you that produces the yearning for higher ground that you feel, and that same intelligence knows the way. We just have to listen and be sensitive to it. An example is your innate ability to discern whether or not music is harmonic. Why is it that one wrong note, a clinker, during a musical performance can make you grimace and wince? You're likely not a professional musician, and you probably have never taken any formal instruction. You don't have to know one thing about music to know a sour note when you hear one. You have an innate intelligence about this that simply knows what is and what is not pleasing to your ears. The same inner intelligence will guide you to success, too. It will reveal what to do next to reach that higher level you yearn for. All you have to do is stop doing and listen. Instead of going silent and listening, however, what we've been taught all our lives is to tell someone about it, to stay busy, to talk to a counselor, to read a book, to attend a class. And I'm asking, well, since none of these has ever delivered what it promises, why don't I try something different? Well, like what? Well, how about the opposite of what I typically and habitually do? So for me, that would be don't talk to someone about it, to deliberately not get busy over it, don't go to a so-called professional for advice, don't read another book, and don't go find a class to attend. Boy, just saying these things I will try not doing for a change to see what happens seems irresponsible. It shakes me up a bit. Well, what's shaking? It seems logical to consider that I should have been born equipped in body and mind to be a whole and successful person. It even seems irreverent to suggest that Mother Nature created me with a huge defect. Let's call it a gaping hole in my makeup that I must run around and seek advice and help from others to patch. And that even seems more ludicrous because they're all running around trying to find others to patch the holes they think they have. What a circus this is. The sad part is, however, that I'm in the center ring. All right, so nothing else I've ever tried has delivered the peace, security, and happiness I seek. So now, I'll try something totally different from what I usually do. I'll be sensitive and alert for those moments when my mind issues commands in answer to some emotion I'm experiencing. When it tells me to go shop, I won't. Or I'll go to the mall and deliberately not buy anything. 
when it tells me to call my friend and tell my tale of woe or brag or seek advice, I won't call. When it tells me to plop down on the couch, vegetate and watch TV as I always do, I'll read a classic book or write or take a walk instead. When I have nothing to do and automatically head for the cookie jar or refrigerator, I'll realize what's happening here and deliberately walk away from the kitchen. Or I'll go to the kitchen, drink a tall glass of water, and leave empty-handed. When my mind tells me to tailgate that car that just cut me off, I'll take my foot off the accelerator and deliberately back way off. When everything in me wants to retaliate and get even with someone, I'll say to myself, let's see how I feel about this next week. When I catch myself saying something that I know I shouldn't, I'll deliberately stop mid-sentence and go against that part of me that now runs my life and keeps me unhappy and searching for more. Deliberately going against what I habitually do in these ways, I will absolutely be in a psychological place I've never been before. I always seek something new and something different. Perhaps this will prove to be just that. Somehow this feels right, and in an unfamiliar way, I sense that this is the new place I should seek. Thanks for joining me this week on The Insight Line. This is Ken Roberts. Could it be that the very things we do to fix our problems are actually making them worse? It's true, but our understanding of a simple spiritual law can help us end problems permanently. Hello, I'm Patricia Wangler. Welcome to the Insight Line. When we are caught up in a flurry of painful thoughts and emotions, we feel as though we're fighting an inner battle. We try to use reason to solve the dilemma and restore our peace of mind. However, when we do anything at all to try to settle or push away this inner condition, we unknowingly set into motion the law of second force. This law operates something like this. To whatever degree force is directed to an object or condition, to an exact and equal measure, the opposite force is also set into motion. This is easy to see for yourself. Watch the next time you're caught up in an emotional storm. Each time you come up with one answer to your problem, a conflicting or opposite answer will soon present itself. And no matter which answer you choose, it's only a temporary solution, for the mind will soon flip to its opposite, saying it made a mistake and should have listened to the other side. Battle fought with thought. This means we should not try to do anything at all with a painful inner state. The more we try to settle it, the more conflict we feel. Sometimes, instead of trying to find a solution through logic, we handle a problem by either repressing it from our awareness, deliberately running away from the battle. This also makes it worse, for this very movement gives the problem our life force. We can see the effect of this when our bottled up emotions finally explode in an angry outburst, draining our energy and wrecking our health. To make matters worse, a few days later after our energy is restored, our muddled thoughts return to wage the same unresolved battle or to present us with a new one. It's endless. But there's good news. We can learn to rise above all battles. Peace can prevail. All we have to do is become smarter than the raging warriors. We do this through self-observation, which shows us the nature of these trouble-loving thoughts. We have to see again and again that they do not have our best interests at heart. All they can do is keep us in turmoil and running in circles. As we become more aware that they have nothing of value to give us, we stop taking direction from them. Author Guy Finley advises, never look at what it's pointing to. Instead, turn around and look at the state that is doing the pointing. When we withdraw our force and attention from confused thoughts, they disappear, for they have no life of their own. They were kept alive only by our fighting and resistance to them. Vernon Howard coined the phrase, resistance to the disturbance is the disturbance. As we work with these ideas, we understand that painful inner storms 
are as mechanical and predictable as any wind-up toy, and in reality just as powerless. Wouldn't it be nice to use our problems to become awake and in charge of our own thoughts and feelings? Not only is this possible, but it is our very purpose here on earth to develop into whole, healthy men and women who no longer hurt ourselves and others. We cannot do this ourselves, but we can begin to work towards understanding what's going on. The truth will actively assist, no, actually lead, a person in their sincere struggle towards a higher life, and that person will know it. We must be willing to persist through all the unenlightened regions of ourselves until finally we rest in the light. This rest is not for some future afterlife, but for us to enjoy hearing now in this life. To be free from the turmoil within is the answer to all questions and yearnings. Thanks for joining me on the Insight Line. This is Patricia Wangler. Does it seem to you that some days of the week are better than others? That's too bad, because thinking that way may be robbing you of some of the best days of your life. Hello, I'm Dr. Ellen Dickstein. Welcome to the Insight Line. One of the most common phrases you'll hear around any office is, thank God it's Friday. The next most common phrase is the response to the question, how are you, if it's asked after the weekend is over. That frequent response is, not too bad, considering it's a Monday. If we only understood that the attitude expressed in these statements was draining us of the potential to enjoy and live fully each moment, perhaps we would not be so flippant with these treacherous cliches. How is it that we forget so easily the very miracle of being alive? Every moment new impressions are coming in. We never know when some pearl of higher wisdom will come to us, filling us with encouragement and new understanding. As children, our anticipation of each day's events was so great, we couldn't wait to jump out of bed in the morning and start exploring. What happened to us as we grew older that makes us feel as though we can barely survive through the week until Saturday comes? And then, when it finally does come, do we truly enjoy it? Or do we spend most of the weekend complaining about the weather, or fighting with the family, or worrying about how quickly Monday morning is sneaking up? A major part of the problem is the way we think. We've divided activities into things we think we like to do and things we don't like to do. And once the label has been put on, our expectations are set. But really, what difference does it make what you're doing as long as you're alert and happy within yourself? Vernon Howard once said, there are no boring jobs, only boring people. It's the internal attitude, not the activity, that determines how much fun you have. Start questioning the way you interpret things and see how everything changes. It's an old joke that people complain about mowing the lawn and then spend $500 to join an exercise club. It's all in your attitude. Another aspect of our wrong thinking is the delusion that while I may not be happy now, when something external happens later, I will be happy. In order to get to that happier time, I'll just put my mind on autopilot for now. But that happier time never comes, does it? The event we anticipated with such excitement is gone before we know it, because the mind that was incapable of focusing prior to the event cannot focus during the event. So, for example, we couldn't wait for the morning to pass so we could enjoy our lunch. Finally, lunchtime comes, but we're so distracted by our thoughts, we don't even know we're eating. Half an hour later, we look down at our empty plate and have no idea what happened. The fact is that the only time we can be happy is right now, and the truly spiritual, awake individual will feel that happiness regardless of the day of the week or what he or she is doing. Again, Vernon Howard put it so perfectly when he said, the truly happy man is one who feels no different when the party ends than he did while it was going on. So the next time a deceitful voice inside you tries to rob you of the pleasure of the present moment, just think to yourself, thank God I'm alive.
thank God I can use the experience of every second to grow and change and become even more aware. Thank God it's Monday. This is Dr. Ellen Dickstein on the Insight Line. Thanks for joining me. A climactic scene in the movie War Games is one that you and I can use to turn our lives around and finally begin to realize our dreams. We can use it to find the peace and happiness we seek. Welcome, this is Ken Roberts on the Insight Line. War Games is a very enjoyable movie and it's worthwhile just for the climactic ending alone. The mighty computer that controls the United States War Department and nuclear missiles takes in all current world information, analyzes it, and decides whether or not to launch our missiles. Through an error, the computer believes that Russia has launched missiles at the United States and it's rapidly working on all possible scenarios and their results to reach its conclusion of whether or not to strike back. The computer does not understand that missiles are not really coming from Russia towards us, and the computer's programmer is quickly brought in as the last hope of shutting the computer down. He says that the only chance of making the computer decide not to launch missiles in retaliation is to make it understand the futility of doing that. As the computer calculates whether or not to launch an attack, the programmer engages it in a game of tic-tac-toe. Because time is of the essence here, he has the computer play the game against itself. So the computer plays game after game of tic-tac-toe at lightning speed and finally concludes that once this game is understood, no one wins. That tic-tac-toe always ends in a draw. Now understanding futility, The computer factors this new knowledge into its ongoing war calculations and sees that a nuclear war is a no-win event. The computer shuts down its operations and announces its conclusion in these words to its professor. Tic-tac-toe is an interesting game, professor. The only winning solution is not to play. You and I can take a valuable lesson from this powerful scene. Isn't the scene of this computer spinning at light speed, grinding out calculations, really just a picture of the world we live in, ourselves included? Here we are among millions of other people, all scrambling, plotting, and computing the so-called important information we take in. Newspaper headlines say something's urgent, and we react. Something else is all over television, and we change plans and worry. Some news that a huge conglomerate is looking to buy out the company we work for sends us into a dither. We overspend on homes, automobiles, and luxuries, and then run ourselves ragged trying to keep up with the payments. We jeopardize and even damage our health and serenity based on an idea that we should and must do this to ourselves. Why do we do it? because like the computer in the movie, we're reacting to erroneous information. So what is the error here? We obviously believe that something bad will happen to us if we do not have and do these things. Now, nothing is wrong with homes, cars, and luxuries. As Shakespeare observed, nothing is either good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. But if a man believes that he must drive a certain kind of car so strongly that he'll give up his serenity and harm his health over it, can this possibly be right and true? If so, then isn't he saying that the value of his life lies in the kind of car he drives? And obviously this isn't so. Well then what? Just like the computer in the movie War Games, he must see the futility in what he's doing. When he does, he'll know not to waste his time and life. And ironically, when you realize you don't need anything at all from anyone or anything, that's when it all comes rushing to you, where you can then pick and choose what you want in your life. 
This is the meaning behind the passage, the meek shall inherit the earth. So take an honest look at what's causing you pain and anxiety. Is it that relationship, your job, a vacation? Anything, whatever it is, has no power to make you feel good or bad, but what you yourself willingly give it. Let it go. See through the game that cannot be won. Remember, the only way to win is not to play. That's the secret of the ages. Until next time, this is Ken Roberts on the Inside Line.